Hello once again, I'm Extra Life. As you can see, I've been playing around with different module configurations in this Eurorack synth case that I built of reclaimed wood while I wait for some other parts to arrive. And as luck would have it, they've just arrived. So I've got all the pieces here to put together a power supply for this case. So today I thought I would show you how to put together a DIY Eurorack power supply. Now, a word of warning before we continue, I'm going to be wiring up a switch mode power supply using AC mains voltage, that's line voltage, or 120 volts in the United States, 220 or 240 volts in other parts of the world. Now, that can be a dangerous voltage to work with if you don't know what you're doing. It's possible to shock or electrocute yourself. So if you don't feel comfortable working with this voltage or doing mains wiring, don't do it. There's no reason to do something that's dangerous or makes you uncomfortable. Uh, there's no reason to be afraid of doing this kind of work. That said, I'm not an electrician. I'm not doing this up to a particular code. I'm not qualified in mains wiring instruction. Follow these directions at your own risk. Always do your own research and make sure that you are following safety procedures that work for you and follow the regulations in your country. So just to look briefly at the products that we've got here, this is a Meanwell RT50B. The RT65B is also very popular. It takes line voltage 120 volts in and spits out plus 12 volts, minus 12 volts, and five volts. And you can adjust the five volt regulation here. This is pretty inexpensive. I think this is about $15. I got it from Jameco, uh, not a sponsored video, but I will put the link down below in case you wanna pick one up. These are very popular in your rack cases because they're compact and very efficient. We've also got some connectors to do the wiring and we've got some bus boards. I think I got these off of Tindy. I will put the link down below if I can find it as well, but you can buy pre-assembled bus boards or make them yourself. And these are bare PCBs, so we're going to put some big old header connectors on them so that we can connect our Eurorack power cables. And last but not least, we've got this little power entry unit, which is where we're going to plug in our Edison cable. Now, this is a three-prong entry, and it's got a built-in EMI filter and switch and fuse. And it's very important that you get one with a built-in switch. You might have seen these. These are maybe a little bit more common. You might be able to get this at a hardware store. Uh, but this is not really useful for Eurorack cases uh, because in order to use one of these, you need another switch somewhere. And now you may have seen this style where there's a big switch on the front panel, but if you're going to wire up one of these that way, you're going to end up with wires directly connected to the outlet coming up to your switch. And those wires will stay live even if the switch is turned off. So this is okay for something like an AC wall wart where you're dealing with you know 12 volts coming from your power supply. But if you're connecting directly to mains voltage, you wanna have the switch at the external supply. So when you switch this off, you don't have any live wires in your case because when you move around modules or plug something in or out, you don't wanna accidentally bump into mains voltage if you can avoid it. Now we're not gonna get very far with this process with all of these modules in the case. So first things first, we gotta take them all out. Now this is what's called a flying bus board. And basically it is just a wire with a bunch of these header connectors on which you can connect your rack power cables. Now this is very compact. It's good for skiff cases that are not deep, but it's kind of a pain to get these cables in and out. Uh, so if you have the option, I would recommend to use a proper printed circuit board for a bus board. Now this here is the little power supply module that I built to go with my 12 volt wall ward power supply. I actually tried this and fried one of the wall wards that I had. So this is obviously not big enough for the case that I've built here. So I'm gonna keep this and I might put it in a smaller case, but for the time being, this is not gonna be used. So let's get it out of here. Now we are back to bare wood and this case is ready to be powered up. So let's do a dry run and make sure that all of our parts fit and we know where they're going to go. And I think this is gonna give us the most room in this case in terms of where we can put modules. All right, after a little bit of playing around, I think I found a layout I like. As you can see, we've got room for some modules above this power supply. We're gonna have both the bus boards on the deep side of each row, and we'll put this power connector, well, as close to the back as we can get it without interfering with it. So by my calculations, that puts the power entry module roughly there, or there.
So this is the coping saw. It's a little bit like a hacksaw. It's got a very similar blade, except it's more aggressive for cutting wood. And it's got a deeper yaw in it to actually be able to make cuts inside the center of a piece of wood. <laughs> got our power entry unit mounted we can position our other components and start attaching them to the case as well so these are the hex sockets I'm using you can see they've got a threaded hole on one side for a bolt and then a screw thread on the other so you can screw it into the enclosure and then remove your PCB later and it separates the PCB by you know just a quarter of an inch or so so that it doesn't make electrical contact with the case now it is technically optional to use standoffs for this. You can screw this directly to the board, but you have to remember that there's going to be solder joints on the back side of this, so they're going to stick out some. So if you screw too tightly down to a wooden case, you will flex or possibly crack the PCB, which obviously isn't good. And if there's metal anywhere on the case that could come in contact with the back of this, then you could get short circuits. So if you're going to screw it directly to the board, then you should use some insulating washers between the PCB and the enclosure so that you don't make electrical contact or mechanical stress on the PCB. I think these are going to fit perfectly well right here where they are. But before we can wire them up to the rest of the power supply, we need to populate them with some header connectors. Here are the box headers we're going to install. You can see there's a notch on one side of the header, and this is for the key DuraRack power header so they don't put it in backwards. And you can see that there's a little notch on the PCB indicating that it goes to the right side. And you'll notice that the minus 12 volt side is near us. Sometimes this is indicated with a red stripe on the ribbon cables. There's usually a red stripe on the minus 12 volt side. So put the minus 12 volts or the red stripe towards us and the key for the header on the right and then we'll just install all of these box headers. Just about does it. I've got both boards fully populated here and I went ahead and shifted to my other soldering iron so that I could use leaded solder for this board because these boards the traces on them are really quite massive and they go a long way. There's a lot of thermal mass in them. I did this one with lead free and it took me a lot longer because the temperature of it had to be higher. So just a quick tip if you're doing a bus board it's much easier with leaded solder. So now it's time to put on the connectors to the power supply itself, and this particular board has spots for these quick disconnect tabs. Uh, and so these are breakaway tabs that'll just be kind of metal stakes. And then we'll use uh, fast on quick disconnect uh, crimped on connectors that will be attached to the wires that go out to the other parts of the circuit. So these break off into smaller tabs and then get inserted into the boards like so. So I've noticed that these legs are actually quite difficult to get into this PCB because the holes are round and the legs are square. So I'm just using a file to round over the legs of each of these tabs before I insert them in the PCB and they go in much easier. So these are the bus boards all put together and I will screw them down to the case in just a second. And we need to start thinking about how we're gonna wire this up. So I've got some heavy duty speaker wire here that'll be thick enough to carry the current we need to carry. I'm not sure what gauge it is, but I believe these connectors are rated for 14 to 20 gauge wire. This just barely fits in. So 
you know, probably 14 or 16 gauge. On the bus board, we use these spade connector terminals as well as here on the power inlet. Now, over here on the power supply, we just use these screw terminals so we can leave these bare. So rather than cutting these all exactly to length, I'm gonna cut enough sections for this just slightly long and then terminate one end of them. And then we'll leave all of the other ends bare so that they can connect up to the power supply and we'll trim those and strip those wire ends in place. All right, that should be just about all the wire we need. We've got three wires here to go to the power connector, four for this board and four for this board. This is a quarter inch blade terminal. I have actually a couple different sizes because some of the connectors I need on the PCBs are a little bit smaller. This is 0.187 inches, but for the power inlet terminals, quarter inch is what we need. So take the end of that and slide it over the end of the wire. And then of course, the proper way to do this is just to use a crimp tool and crimp this wire here. I used to have one of those. I don't know where it is. Uh, so I'm just gonna try and kind of MacGyver this a little bit. I'm gonna use two cutoff nails and this little vise, and I'm gonna try and create a pinch point so that I can just clamp around the thin part of this crimp tool and then crimp it manually. but these are all finally on. I'm gonna take one little extra step and put some heat shrink over the wire and the connector just to kind of provide some redundant insulation because some of these will be carrying mains voltage. I wanna color code these wires so there's no confusion later on. So we're gonna use red for live and black for ground and yellow neutral. All right, at last it is time to do some wiring. I've got my cables all crimped up here and the connector that we're going to be wiring of course is the inside of the power connector which is an IEC 320C13 socket. Now if we look at the input socket we'll see here that if the ground pin is up then the leftmost pin is the live wire or the hot wire and the right pin is the neutral wire. So if we're looking at this this is the outside of the case so we would reverse it to look at the inside of the case and see that the right wire, or the one which is lower down, much like the socket here, is the live wire. So we will take our red wire and connect it to the live terminal. Likewise, we will take our ground wire, which in this case we're going to assign to black, and then we will take the neutral wire, which is the return path for the current. We've used yellow for that, and we'll put it on the neutral terminal. So. I'm gonna cut all these wires to length real quick and then we'll strip them. I've got the wires cut to length, take the wire stripping tool and trim off just enough, I don't know, maybe a quarter inch till we can fit inside this little socket here. So if we look at the labelings on the back of the power supply here, we have terminals for L and N, which are live and neutral. And then we have this ground terminal here with this funky symbol on it. That of course is a ground symbol. Then we have NC, which is not connected. V3, which is voltage three in this case, is gonna be minus 12 volts, plus V2, which will be our 12 volt supply, COM, which is the ground for the low side of the terminals, and then plus five volts, which I would hope is self-explanatory. So we need to connect these to the first three terminals over here. All right, now that we've got that connected, we can stay these cables a little bit better. So for that, I'm gonna use some coax staples. The other thing, of course, you can use are zip ties. I like to use one at each end. Like that, the mains wiring for this is now done. And you can see that it is very secure, it's not going anywhere. Doing this is gonna be almost exactly the same, except that since we have two bus boards, we're gonna to need to make two connections in each of these screw terminals over here. All 
Right, and with that, the wiring for this should be pretty much done. But before we plug it in, I'm just going to do a couple quick checks with the multimeter to make sure that everything is in fact connected where I think it is. So I'm going to put it in continuity mode, and I'll connect the black and white probes together. And you can hear that we get a buzz whenever something is connected. To. First thing, I'm going to check for short circuits between any two of these probes. None of these should be connected to each other, except maybe the common and the ground. I'm not really sure if that is that way, but we'll find out. So live and neutral are isolated. And I'm just double checking that we still get the buzz there. Neutral and ground are isolated. Live and ground are isolated. And so I'm just going to connect each of these to double check and make sure that none of them beep. I'm just going to do one last check that the live wire is connected to where I think the live wire is supposed to go. And not short circuited to the other. The neutral is where I think the neutral is supposed to go. And the ground. All right, I think that's as much checking as I can figure out how to do. So let's plug it in and see if this little LED turns on. Huh, would you look at that? There's no fuse in there. So you can see this has a spot for a spare and then you put the fuse in this little plastic clip right here. So I will grab a 10 amp fuse and see if we can do that. It's funny, you know, I ordered this part before and I used it in another synth case and I could have sworn it came with the fuses pre-installed. And let's try this again. Connect that. And again, we're watching for that LED over there to turn on. Flip the switch. Yeah, success. So I'll put my multimeter in volts mode. Set that back here. And I'm gonna put the uh, ground probe anywhere on the ground pins, which is this kind of big group of six pins in the middle here. We should get minus 12 volts. Minus 11.9 is all right. Plus 12 volts. 11.3, a little low, and 5 volts, 5.1. We could adjust that with the pot over on the bus board, or on the power supply, rather, and then we'll check this one. So with that, I think this case is ready to go back together. The only thing I'm a little bit worried about is that there are these terminals here which are slightly exposed. Those are technically connected to live wires. These spade terminals I got, I don't know, they're a little bit shorter than the uh, blades on the power supply, so I think I'll just wrap some electrical tape on those to make sure that there's no possibility of accidentally connecting.
Well, there we go. That is a fully operational battle station, a powered Eurorack case with all DIY wiring. I think it's working great so far. I have noticed there's some sensitivity to initial conditions with some of these modules, in particular these digital ones, the Nozori and the Piston Honda. They don't like to be turned on at the same time as there's a lot of other digital modules on the circuit. So I installed this little two-way power switch which can turn each row on separately, but I'm still finding that this Nozori in particular is very sensitive, so I might just install a separate power supply for the other row. You can imagine how that would go. We would stick this down in the corner and then put the uh, power wiring in parallel or just daisy chain it from the first one and then have each power supply supplying a different bus board. Before I sign off, I want to say a huge thanks to my friend Brett who kindly donated a huge number of these modules since he was getting rid of his hardware collection. So thank you very much, Brett. I really appreciate it and I'm very excited to get these up and running and making some music. I also have to say a huge thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon who make this possible. It means the world to me to have your support and it means I'm able to make more of these videos more frequently. So thank you very much. And if you're interested in getting a little bit of bonus content as well as early access to all of my new videos, head over to patreon.com slash extra life and become a supporter today. Well, I think that about does it for today. I'm looking forward to making some more wild and weird sounds with this machine, and I'll be sure to share those with you when I do. So thank you very much. I will see you next time.